Okay, great. So let's get started with um, some text analysis. So like we said, this is we're working a lot based on this book by Julia Silge and David Robinson. And we're going to start off with a lot of the super basics and then um, we'll get into working with n-grams, which is kind of the main the main topic that we're going to be expanding on today. So first we'll have you load quite a few packages here. Um, Tidyverse, of course. Tidy text is the one that's going to be the most useful for uh, the text analysis situation. It's really developed to work with text in as easy way as possible. Then there's also a stringer that does a lot of uh, text manipulation things. We're going to work with some text from Project Gutenberg today, which is an online collection of public domain texts. And you can access those easily through R with um, Gutenberger. And then there's a couple more here that are for specific applications, like reading in text files, creating networks of bigrams, and visualizing those networks. So first, we're going to load in the data. And like I said, it comes from Project Gutenberg, which has all the texts that are in the public domain. So that includes a lot of classic literature, anything that's over a certain amount of years since it's been published. And you can easily look through this. I'm just going to really quickly go through how to look through this. But it's something if it's something that you want to do, it's definitely worth looking into a little bit more. And we have a little bit of information you can go over there. But Basically, the Gutenberger package, which we loaded in up here, has a file of metadata, which allows you to look at all the books that are in the public domain. And depending on your country, you might be able to look at this online. I think in Germany, it's a little bit hard to access it, but um, you can always access it through R with this Gutenberg metadata. And so you can like look through this and you can see what kind of texts are in here. There's all sorts of stuff from the Mayflower Com Compact and the United States Constitution, all the way through to books like Aladdin, um, The Wizard of Oz, and so on. So we're just going to pull up the books that we want to work with today by looking for them by title. And we're going to be working with uh, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and some other fairy tales. We're going to be comparing different types of fairy tales to just go through the basics of looking at different texts and how they are similar and different. So you can look up from the Gutenberg metadata using title, just filtering like we have uh, shown a few times. So you can filter for the title. You can also filter for the author and you can use um, string detect to look for a partial name. I'll just leave that there so you can use that if you need to use it. So let's get these texts. So we found them that they are the IDs 112591 and 1597. So if we, do this command, then we're going to actually get the data um, in our environment. So now we have Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and Grimm's Fairy Tales and Hunt Christian Anderson Fairy Tales. And we have like the entire book line by line how it shows up in a book. So you can look through that and all the books are kind of all put in there, um, one on top of each other. And I use this link because it works for me in Germany, but um, depending on where you are and how, what, what you're, how you're connected to the internet, then maybe this plain one would also work. Okay, but now we have our data that we're gonna be working with today. And the first thing we wanna do, I just wanted to do something to clean it up a little bit, which is right now we have the ID, which is how we found these um, texts again, through the Gutenberg project. And I just wanna replace them with uh, the, their actual titles. So I'm, for that, I'm going to use mutate tidyverse command for creating new columns. So we're going to take our data set and we'll pipe it to mutate to make a new column called Gutenberg ID, uh, well, which is going to replace the existing Gutenberg ID column by recoding the factor levels so that instead of 11, we have Alice Adventures in Wonderland. Instead of 2591, we have Grimm's Fairy Tale. And instead of 1597, we have Hunt Christian Anderson fairy tale. And I'm going to make sure that's a factor. OK, so now we have our text, and it's appropriately labeled. And we can get started with text analysis. So we're going to work with a tidy text uh, format today, which is also promoted by the tidy text package and falls in line with a lot of the tidyverse stuff that we've been doing recently. Hello, sorry mm -hmm. to interrupt, but um, yeah. 
some people in the chat are saying, can you slow down just a little bit? Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> Getting a bit too excited. Trying, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I was just um, trying to quickly go through the Gutenberg stuff because I wasn't, I didn't know if that's something that people were interested in or if they would be coming with their own text. So yeah, is there any particular questions to this that I should? Um, no, not that? so far. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna go slower. That part I was kind of rushing through because uh, I wasn't sure how applicable it really was. But yeah, we're gonna work with a tidy. So yeah, we're gonna work with a tidy text framework. And you might be familiar with the idea of tidy data, which would have one observation on every row of your data set. But tidy text is, is similar and you're gonna have one token per row. And when we talk about tokens in text analysis, what we mean is just whatever your meaningful unit is. So here it's going to be one word. And then later, um, Julia is going to tell you a bit more about working with more than one word. But um, for the sake of getting into the topics, we're going to start with doing it just on single words. So right now we have the text in full lines, right? So there's way more than one word on each line here. Um, so we need to get that so that's just one word on every single line. And the tidy text package has this function called unnest tokens. And the syntax for that is that you call unnest tokens, you give the data frame name, and you give um, a new column, however you want to call it. So whatever you want the tokens to be separated into. And then you give the column that you have existing right now. So right now we have the column called text, right? So we're going to um, call, so we're gonna take fairy tales raw and we're gonna pipe it. Remember the pipe means that this is going to be the first argument in the following function. And so we're gonna pipe it to unnest tokens and we're going to give the name of the new column, which we want to be called word. And then we'll give the existing column, which is currently called text. So I'm gonna save this also to a new data frame called um, fairy tales tidy. And we see now is we have just one word on every single line. And conveniently, it's also gotten rid of these um, empty lines and some of the strange stuff that's going on in this original text. And it's gotten it down to just really clean one word per line. It also takes out punctuation and it sets everything to lowercase so it's more easily comparable. And by default, this is doing by word. So it's going to, if we don't say anything special about it, it will do it by word, but we'll show you later how to do it in bigger chunks. Um, I have some code here, which will show you how to keep the sentence number, which you basically do by like taking the text, splitting it first into sentences, and then giving it a number and then splitting it into words. Um, but that's, I don't think we're actually going to use that, but just that you have that, that code in case you want to use it or something like it for a future project. Okay, so, so far we've just done unnest tokens and we've taken our text, which was line by line and looked kind of like a book page and we've broken it down to this really clean word by word, no punctuation, no capitals. Now you may have some characters in your text that you want to remove that maybe don't get removed by the unnest tokens. And for example, in our data here, there are sometimes um, underscores which indicate italics, but we don't really want these, these underscores in the text. So we can take these out with a function from Stringer. Um, and there's two ways we could do this. I, so first of all, there's string extract, and this will use something called a regular expression, which you can program or you can customize to have whatever function you want. And it will just match whatever the regular expression is looking for. So here we have a regular expression that's saying any letter from A to Z uh, or an apostrophe followed by anything. And what it's gonna do is it's just gonna match the first time it finds that in the, in the string that it's given and it's gonna return that. So if we run this, we see that the first thing that it finds is just this word test. And then when it comes to a non-alphanumeric, it breaks. Now, because we only have one 
a word per row. This is what we want to do. So that is what we're going to use down here. But I also want to show you this uh, string remove all. And that's going to find specific characters and remove them only from string. So if we take again, this string as our input. If we want to remove all the underscores only, then we can do string remove all, tell that we want to remove underscores, and it will take all the underscores out of this word, uh, this string. So again, the difference here is here we have to use a regular expression. So you have to kind of know a little bit about how regular expressions work. We've written this one to be just the first word that doesn't, not including any characters that are non alphanumeric. Whereas string remove all finds only one character and it removes it every single time it finds it. So we're going to use the first one, like I said, because there's only one word here. And if we run that, then now we should get rid of those underscores in, um, in our text. And if it's something that you're interested in, this is all from the package stringer, which looks like string R. And they have a couple of similar functions and they're all for doing this kind of thing, like removing characters or using regular expressions. So there's a couple other options there that you, you could look at depending on what kind of data you're working with. Uh, are there any questions so far? Uh, no, no questions. Okay. okay, so so far what we've done is we've taken our messy text and we have made it into clean one word per line with no weird characters in it. Now, one other thing we might want to do to prepare our data for analysis is we might want to remove stop words. And stop words are very common words that are quote unquote meaningless. Of course, from a linguistic perspective, they are not meaningless. But if you're looking for what kinds of words does this text use, uh, you might not really be interested in knowing how many times it says the word the or of or to. And these are really easy to remove with tidy text because it has a built in data frame that contains all of these that you can easily use to kick these words out of your out of your data set. So this data frame is called stop underscore words. And here we're using the head command to look at the first 20 lines. So again, this comes from the tidy text package. It's a data frame that's included. So here it shows you which words are in the stop word list and it's words like about, um, across, after, allows. So it, and there's quite a lot of words here, but basically if you remove all these words, all you're left with could possibly be uh, content words. So we're gonna use the command anti-join to remove these. And what anti-join does is it takes a data frame and um, it removes anything from this data frame, the first one that you give it, that's also found in the second data frame. So we can take fairy tales tidy and we can anti join the stop words and that will kick out all the stop words. And then we can save that. So if we run this, you can see this is a little bit of the intro, but if you skip a little, um, further into it, you can see that we have only content words left like rabbit hole, Alice, beginning, tired, sitting, sister, bank. So a lot of the basic yeah, connecting words and um, less meaningful verbs are taken out. Yeah, you can also, so if there's words in that you want to remove that are not in the stop words list, you can easily make your own stop word list. So here we have um, like, so in, I think in some of the fairy tales, there was words like thy and thee or thou. Um, and if we want to remove those, what we can do is quickly make a little tibble, which is like a little data frame, which just has one column called word that includes all of these words that we don't want to include. So when we make this, then we have this meaningless words data frame, which just includes the words that we don't want in our data frame. And similar to how we did with the stop word list, we can anti-join the meaningless words and it will kick them out just like how we kicked out the stop words above. So if we run this, then yeah, we now have um, the, data frame from before, but 
additionally, these words that we've defined have been removed. So this can be useful if you're trying to um, take out certain terms as well. They don't have to be stop words. So say you keep coming up with only character names, then you could take out character names if you weren't interested in them. So say you didn't want to see Alice show up all the time in Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, then you could remove that from your data frame as well. And one last thing about stop words, there's a package called stop words, which includes stop words for other languages. So for example, there's one for German stop words, which would include yeah, the same types of words, but uh, in German. Yeah, does, it, does that make sense with uh, stop words and removing stop words? Any questions? Um, yeah, there's a um, question about if you could add your custom stop words to that data frame to have it kind of all in one place. Um, yeah, you could. So you could, you couldn't, yeah, you could basically um, just attach them to the bottom of the stop word list. So say you had the stop words, you could like row bind your um, additional words below. Maybe you could give it the lexicon name custom or something, but then you would have to save that stop word list. So right here you can see that there's the data frame stop words which comes from the package and it's actually not in my um or here it's in my yeah it's not in my environment because it's actually only stored in the package and it's not stored like locally so if you did that you would have to make sure you saved it back to your um yeah back to your environment what you could also do is like do it in one step and you could anti-join the stop words and then you could kind of carry on and also anti-join um like I think I called it meaningless words. So you could also do it like that, which honestly is probably easier than like trying to combine them and then take them out together. Yeah, anything else? Um, no, thank you. Okay. Okay, so let's um, take a look at our data now. We have only one word per row. We have all of the quote unquote meaningless words removed so that now we only have content words and we're ready to do a little bit of analysis. So the first thing we can do is just count frequencies of words and find which words are the most frequent in each of our books. So we wanna compare these different types of, of fairy tales, right? So we can do that using count. And so in, we want to make sure that we count not how many times the word shows up in the data frame, but how many times it shows up in each book, right? So we, we don't want to mix up the books. So for that, we're going to do kind of a two-step process. We'll start with the data frame with our, with our words in it, and we'll group it by the Gutenberg ID. So this is just making sure that, yeah, R knows that we want to keep the books separate based on their title. And then we can just use count and give the name of the column, which is word. And I've added this sort equals true here just because it will put them in, in, in order from most frequent to less, least frequent words. And I'm gonna go ahead and save this as a, as a new data frame called fairy tales um, freak for frequency. So if we do that, we group by and then we count then we can see how many times words show up in each book. So we have the title, the word, and how many times that word was found in that, in that book only. So Alice shows up 399 times in Alice Adventures in Wonderland. Um, King shows up a lot in Grimm's fairy tale, same as father and mother, wife, so on. So now we have um, a data frame which includes the frequency counts for each word. And um, here I'm just showing you how to look at just one book, for example, like if we only want to look at Grimm's fairy tales, then we could do the same process of grouping by the title, counting the number of times each word shows up, and then only looking at one book. So Grimm's fairy tales, how many times each word shows up in that book, or there's um, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. 
then we can see the most common words in just that book just by adding this filter, filter command. Yeah, are there any questions on that part? Uh, no, no questions. Okay. okay. So now we have all of the counts, how many times each word shows up in each book and we can plot this. So I wanna look, for this plot, I'm gonna look only at Grimm's fairy tales just to keep it from being, you know, we don't want to have like 100 bars in our bar chart. We just want to have a few. So I'm going to go ahead and already just cut down the data frame to be only Grimm's fairy tales and only words that show up at least 90 times. So you see this gives us 40 rows, the top um, 40 words in Grimm's fairy tales. So I can do that little, that little step. And then I'm going to go ahead and pipe it directly into a ggplot call. So ggplot, we're going to define our aesthetics, our aesthetic levels. We want to have n on the x-axis. That's the count of the words. And we want the word on the y-axis. Here, I've added this little trick um, of reorder, which you can use to set, yeah, to order the, um, the levels of a factor. So I'm ordering word by the number. And what this is going to do is just show them in order. I'll show you in a second. And I'll define the fill. And then we'll use geom column because we are already giving the number. We don't want to count. And let me just run it. Okay, so you see now we have the most frequent words and each one is a bar and they're ordered by the number. So you could also do this with just saying why is word, but then it's going to give them in whatever order that they are in the text. So that's also effective, but um, I like it a little bit better ordered by word. And then I've added just a couple of aesthetic things here, like um, labels for the y-axis, the x-axis and the title. I put the minimal to give this white background. And oh, actually this part, we don't really need any more. The element text, I don't think. So actually all I've done is added the theme. So this is a really easy way then to get a visualization of the top words in one text. And we could easily change this like we did above to Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Oops, that one doesn't have as many words. So let's say above 50 or maybe above 30. And you can get like a similar graph for your different texts. Yeah, is there any, are there any other questions about that? Um, no, no more questions. Okay. Okay, so we've taken the text, we've broken it into words, we've taken out any weird characters, we've taken out the stop words, and now we've graphed the, um, the most common words in each text. But you could already see the problem when I switched from, well, Grimm's Fairy Tales to Alice in Wonderland here, which is that apparently Grimm's Fairy Tales just has a lot more words. So if I had, um, if I was looking for words that showed up at least 90 times, then in Alice in Wonderland, that was only one word and the word was Alice. So they are definitely different sizes. And the way that we can deal with this is through a metric called TFIDF. And TF-IDF stands for term frequency inverse document frequency. But basically what it does is it, it can help you identify which words are um, informative or especially frequent in a specific text. So it's a text mining um, metric that's basically been developed for this reason. And it looks at how often, yeah. So basically what you don't wanna have is to see that like the word the shows up in all the books very frequently. You want to know which words are distinctive of that text that show up a lot in that text and, and less often in other texts. Uh, if you want to know a little bit more on how it works, there here's like the chapter from or the section of the tidy text mining book where you can look at that, or you can also look on the Wikipedia page. But basically, if the if the TF IDF is low then it's a word that appears in many of the books that, that you're currently comparing. 
Uh, but if it's high, it occurs in just a few books. So if it's high, it's distinctive for that text. And the tidy text package has a function for this called bind tfidf. And to use this, basically you, you pipe in the data frame as the first argument, and then you bind um, tfidf. And you have to give it the column of your tokens. So here we're working with Word, the column that identifies which book it's coming from or which text. So here it's Gutenberg ID and also the end, so the count. So if we run that and then take a look at it. So I'm, I've saved it to this data frame called fairy tales IDF. And if I take a look at like the Gutenberg ID and the word and the TF IDF, you can see that it will identify which words are distinctive for that book. So in Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, then Alice is particularly distinctive. That makes sense. Um, also words like Hatter shows up a lot more in Alice's Adventures in Wonderland than in our other fairy tales. Griffin, Rabbit, that makes sense. Whereas um, Hans Christian Andersen's fairy tales has Gerda, I guess that's a character name, and things like Shadow. And then Grimm's fairy tales, Gretel, that makes sense, or Wolf, Dwarf. So it's, it's identifying which, which words are um, distinctive for those texts. So now I want to visualize this. Sorry, Kyla, before you do that, maybe can you explain again how you read the TF IDF number? Like, how do you interpret that? Mm -hmm. So the TF IDF right now in this in this data frame, I have it sorted by descending TF IDF. So the, the highest TF IDFs are at the top. And it looks like a small number, but it's it's high compared to the TF IDFs that any anything else is getting in this data frame. And that's why it's at the top with um, the arrange call. And basically, if a if a number if a word is getting a high TF IDF score, then that word is particularly distinctive for that text, which means that it shows up a lot in that text, and not very often in your other texts. So here we're directly. It's all relative and here we're directly comparing it to our other two fairy tales that exist in this data frame. And so we see that the words that come up um, with really high numbers, relatively high numbers, I guess, compared to the other, the other rows are distinctive for that text. So they, yeah, they, yeah, particularly are represented or they're highly represented in that text compared to other texts. And the reason why it's interesting to look at the words that are represented highly in one text and not in the other text is because it's it will pull it will get rid of words that are common in all texts so if all texts talk a lot about uh, say they use the word talking a lot in all of the texts it's not really interesting to us to know that okay the word talking shows up a lot in all the books so that's going to get probably a lower tf idf score because it's going to show up in all of the text a lot and the words that are going to get a higher one are ones that show up a lot but just in one one of the groups one of the texts Okay, thanks. Um, another question while we're at it. Uh, could you specify a limited number of words that you want to compare, for example, specifically mock or rabbit and nothing else? Is that something this method allows for? Yeah, so you can, um, you can do that. You could, so you would want to run the TF IDF on everything. You wouldn't want to filter before you run the TF IDF because that would make the calculation of the you know, it has to have kind of all the words that are that are there in order to um, produce an appropriate number. So you wouldn't want to filter it before you ran the TF IDF. But once you already have it, like in my data frame here, TF IDF or fairy tales IDF, then you could either filter to look for certain words. Um, so let's say we wanted to look for mouse. It's going to be in the word column. That one didn't show up that much in any of the, so that one's not really distinctive of any of them. But let's try, yeah, I think it was like door mouse. That one only shows up in this one text, but you could do something like that, or you could kind of create a list of words that you want to look for. So say, hmm, um, let's try something that might show up in a bunch of texts, something like that.
then you could filter to include only those words, and then you could kind of compare their TF-IDFs across, across different texts. You're seeing a lot of really small numbers, and it's because these words are more strongly represented in other texts, where they're not particularly distinctive of that text. But for example, mother is more strongly represented in Grimm's fairy tales and Hans Christian Andersen's fairy tales than it is in Alice in Wonderland. Yeah, which it doesn't, doesn't seem to show up at all. So you could do things like that. Yeah. And another question. <laughs> is the TF-IDF dependent on the number and types of books you are comparing? Um, it's, I think it's definitely relative to the sample that you give it. So if it's going to be comparing based on those texts. So you can't say that like the absolute TF-IDF for the word uh, Dormouse in Alice in Wonderland is a certain number. It's it, it's always relative to the other books that you're giving it to to compare. And so here we have yeah different sort of content words. Um, but you could also use this for other types of text, or you could also use it for chapters or like sections of a text. So it's always looking at one grouping, however you want to define that grouping. So we've done it by books because that kind of makes sense. Uh, when you're comparing different books of a similar type, but you could also do it by chapter by chapter and then you could kind of see, okay, how does the word despair develop over these chapters or which words are particularly indicative of certain chapters of a book. Or you could also use it for um, text that comes off different web pages or different different um, social media communities. So it's all based on groupings. It doesn't have to be based on books, but it just, yeah, you just have to give it your meaningful grouping to compare to. Thanks, that's it for now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so I just wanna show you actually one last thing before we get into n-grams. And that would be like a little visualization of TF-IDF for this text. I'm, I'm gonna run it and then tell you what, what we're doing here. So this is what the output looks like. It has each book, it gets a little cut off here, and it shows you which words are particularly indicative of that text. So that we've looked at this a little bit already, but like, again, you see Alice, especially in Alice in Wonderland. I think that's pretty clear. And then you can see like Grimm's fairy tales talks about like Hansel and Gretel, whereas Hans Christian Andersen's talks about other things like princesses or snow, watchmen, reindeer, and so on. So how did we make this, <laughs> this graph? First of all, we're gonna do a little bit of data wrangling. I'll show you that individually, which is we take the data frame, which has the TF-IDF score in it. We once again group by the book. We have to keep reminding uh, R that we wanna keep the books together. And we are going to sort by the TF-IDF. This is again, just what we did kind of above, but I've added here top N. And top N is a command that looks at the top however many items based on a, a number in a different column. So here we want the top 20 items that have the highest TF-IDF based on the grouping of uh, the, the title. And that gives us like a, a much smaller data frame here with just 64 rows where it gives us, yeah, for each, for each book, there's 20 items that have a, the highest TF-IDF score. And so if we take this and feed that into ggplot, so not the original data frame, but this little mutated or this changed data frame, and we put tf-idf on the x-axis and we put the word on the y-axis and just like above, I've reordered it just to sort it by, this time by tf-idf. And here we've just colored it based on the book. Um, and we do the columns again, so it's all like the graph above. And then we've just added facet wrap so facet wrap, if we didn't facet wrap, then you wouldn't be getting like one graph per book. You'd be getting like all the books all mixed in and only the color would show you which book you are working with. But if you add facet wrap, then it, that's why it gives you like three columns, each with its own, with each book is represented in its own individual graph with facet wrap and theme minimal because we like the way that looks. So if you do that, then you have a really nice visualization which shows you the differences in the vocabulary between three, three texts in a way that's um, not dependent on the overall size of the text. 
Yeah, so next, uh, Julia is going to walk you through how to do all of these things again using ngrams. So if it seemed a little bit fast, uh, she's going to go through basically the same commands again. She's just going to tell you how to work with them if you want to look at something beyond just the level of a single word. But if any of these commands, you know, if, if anything's not making sense, it's a good time to ask questions and we can uh, clear that up before we talk about how to do it with multiple, like multi word units. Yeah, so before we before I do that, um, there are two questions. One mm -hmm. of them is on the data, so I'll ask that first. So when you did the top uh, top 20, there's a question, why do you get 64 rows if you chose the top 20? And it's three books. Oh, wow, very That's good. good. Very good question. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like there might just be ties. Like some, some words might get the same TF-IDF and then R chooses all of them. Right, like it, yeah, instead I of guess. just picking the first one. That mm -hmm. might be it, yeah. Yeah, oh yeah, like look, these two are actually exactly the same, TF-IDF. Yes. So, yeah. okay, very um, astute observation, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think that's just because, yeah, like you said, the ties. Yeah, and the other one is a, is a bit of a philosophical question. Uh, can we say that data wrangling is essentially data manipulation or do you have a better definition? Um, I think when you start talking about data manipulation, then it starts to sound like you're trying to influence your data to be something it's not, whereas data wrangling more implies, um, like the word wrangling kind of comes from this idea of like getting all, like kind of like getting all of the animals into the pen or like kind of getting something that's unruly and making it tidy, which I think is more fitting. So when you talk, yeah, you don't want to sound like you're manipulating your data in order to like fulfill and hypothesis or something that you already have. So that's why I, I, I always use the word data wrangling, or um, you could also say data pre-processing. So putting it kind of into the format that you need it, but you're not actually trying to change any of the underlying patterns of the data. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I would, I would add to so my not very elegant um, definition of, of data wrangling is getting the data in whatever format you need for your subsequent plots or analyses or whatever else. Yeah. yeah, I think the only thing that we're doing here that really changes the underlying data is removing the stop words. And that is something you want to be really careful about. So depending on what kind of analysis you're doing, you might not want to remove all the kinds of words that are in the stop word list. So um, like I think when we saw the stop word list, it had words like allows or some things that depending on what, what kind of application you have, maybe you do want that kind of information to still be in your data. So that's the only step that I would say you have to be, or not the only step, but that's the main step where I would say you have to be careful about what choices you make with your data. Yeah, for sure. Um, and there's one question that I can quickly answer. So um, any way to combine words with the same root automatically, like evolution, evolutionary, and so on, or uh, singular plural, so tree and trees and so on. And um, I know we have a few linguists here who will be familiar with the concept of lemmas, and that's exactly what you're talking about. So um, there R, so in R, I know that there's what's called a stemmer or stemming is possible. That would mean just kind of chopping off the end of a word. Um, so just kind of chopping off um, an S so that you would have singular and plural forms um, as one and they wouldn't be counted separately. That's in my opinion, not a very good option. There's also a process called um, lemmatization where you, um, where that's a little bit more elaborate and that tries to find that base form. So that would be um, evolution in your, in your example. Um, I'm not sure if there's a good lemmatizer in R at the moment. Um, if anyone knows of any a good lemmatizer in R, uh, let me know. Um, but that's definitely a good observation because we don't really, for, for most or for many analysis, we don't want to count these separately. Yeah, maybe that's something we'll, maybe we'll have a meetup on that at some point. That's not something that's in um, Julia Silgi's book, but it would be an interesting question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I also want to say um, for this kind of stuff too, if you want more practice with this than any weren't at our previous meetups, then those files are also on our GitHub and we have a couple of exercises. So we cut the exercises from this today so that we could get on to talking about bigger units, uh, but there's a little bit more there that you can play around with if you want to get a bit more familiar. 
yeah, but now I'll hand over to um, Yulia for talking about n-grams. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Kaina. All right. Okay, so before we talk about n-grams and what they are and what the n stands for, uh, we'll do a little bit more data wrangling, whatever that means. So we'll uh, get our data in the format that we actually want it to be in. Um, so for this part, we'll work with just um, Alice, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, so just that book. Um, so the first thing I'm doing is I'm creating this new data frame calling it Alice and I'm going through a couple of steps and I'll explain them one by one. So first I'll filter so that only Alice's adventures in Wonderland um, remain, everything else gets um, kicked out of that new data frame. Then what I'll need for some analyses is going to be which chapter something was in. Um, and this is a little bit, this is a little bit of a tricky piece of code, but we'll go through it together and, and it'll be fine. So what's happening in the book is that you'll have um, chapter and then that will be followed by a number or, or a Roman numeral. In this case, it's a Roman numeral, but this actually also finds any other numbers. Um, so what this will do, this line of code, this piece of code um, is it'll find chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, and so on um, in the text. And then it will basically extract the chapter number from that. So this first part, this stands for cumulative sum. Um, and you can, I like to think of that as a counter that starts at zero and it ticks up by one um, if it finds chapter followed by a number. So this is really just a counter starts at zero. And then if this is true, it counts up by one. So, and what does the second part do? So this is string detect. So finding, detecting, finding a string in our text column. And then the question is which string do we want to find? And this is a regular expression. Um, and what this, this does is it finds uh, lines that start with chapter and then are followed by either a number. So the backslash 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 D stands for just any number or that is followed by Roman numerals. So here I've just typed them in. Um, so again, so this is find, so find in the text column, um, the, the string basically chapter and then a space here and then Roman numerals or any other numbers. In this case, it's Roman numerals, but you can reuse that um, regex hopefully for other, um, yeah, for other texts as well. And this part is just um, ignore case. So it can be lowercase, it can be uppercase, it doesn't matter. So every time this string detect is true, so every time chapter and numbers are found, our counter, counter goes up by one. And that will be saved in this chapter variable. Um, okay, and what I'm doing after that is I'm just getting rid of the Gutenberg ID because we don't need that. It's all the same book. Um, I'm getting rid of um, chapter equals um, zero because that's just the book title, the author, some information on the edition and, and things like that. We don't need that. Um, I'm converting that to a factor. And then I'm also removing all underscores. So I'm running that. And just to show you what it looks like, um, I've just picked the text and the chapter. So you see it's line by line, chapter one. And there's the text. And then here's the chapter column. And then if we go, if we scroll down, basically you'll see it'll jump to um, two and it'll be, yeah, here we are. It'll be in chapter two. So if we go back to the text, we can see chapter two starts here. So that worked. Okay, so that's some data prep. Is there a question on the um, on this part? Because that's a little bit tricky. Okay, all right. So now let's talk about engrams now that we've gotten past that. Um, so we'll again use this unless tokens um, function and it lets you define what a token is. So for us, a token, so the unit of analysis um, has been single words. Um, 
And the argument for that would be token equals words. And that's also the default. So if you don't write anything there, it'll just um, unnest two single words, one word on a line. But we would like to look at multi-word combinations and they are called engrams and not single words. So an engram is just um, a combination of consecutive words, so they have to follow each other. Um, it can't be just two words that are in the same sentence, they just have to follow each other. Um, and the N just stands for how many words, how many consecutive words. So that's why we say of length N, it's just how many consecutive words are we looking at. So if we have N equals two, so that will be two consecutive words, and that's what we'll mostly look at today. And those are also called bigrams, you could also do n equals um, tr uh, three, that would be trigrams. And then you could do n equals four, that would be four grams and so on. So you could go in, into kind of bigger units. So we want to see basically by doing that, we'll see which words often occur right next to each other. So we'll use unnest tokens. We'll call the new column bigram because we're looking at um, n equals two, so two word units. Um, the text is in the text column and we need to write token equals n-grams to make sure that we're getting multi-word units. And we also need to tell our how many words should it, should it show us. And because we want bigrams here, we'll do n equals two. And I'm saving that to Alice bigrams. And here we are. So you can see we have chapter one, down the, the rabbit, rabbit hole. So you can see that each word um, pops up twice. So we have Alice was and then was beginning, beginning to, to get, you get the idea. So this whole text is now split up into these bigrams, two word units. So there's this overlap. And we could um, change the N. So we could say we want four grams. I'm not saving that, I just, I'm just showing you. And now you can see we have four word units. Okay, so as Kyla said, we'll kind of retrace our steps a little bit and go through a lot of the, the, the analysis steps that we've gone through for single words and we'll do the same for engrams. So the first thing we might, might want to do is count them up. So we can do count bigram and then use a range to sort them or we can just use sort equals true, the equivalent. So you can see the most um, frequent one is actually NA, so empty lines, and we'll get rid of these in a second. And then after that, we have a set the of the set Alice and so on, and we have the queen. So because we have these empty lines, we would like to remove those. And we can do that by using drop NA and then bigram. So drop any lines where bigram is empty. And the empty bigrams just come from the empty lines. Um, yeah, the empty lines that were in the original text. Um, okay, so I'll run this. And then we'll just run the count command again. And now you can see that those empty lines are gone or empty bigrams are gone. Okay, any questions so far? No, I was just um, answering a question that asked about doing it by sentence. And mm -hmm. this has a, you can actually give like token equals sentence. Yes. Yeah. Unless tokens has a, a couple of options. I think you can also analyze tweets with that. Never tried that, but I think it has a bunch of options. If you go into the documentation, you can see what, what else it can do. Um, okay. So as you'll notice in this in this um, table of counts, we again have a lot of our stop words. So in the and the to the, that's not exactly fascinating text analysis right now. So we would like to remove these. And for single words, we could just use the stop word list and use an anti-join to match up the word, the single words with whatever's in the stop word list. Um, but because these are bigrams, so two words, that won't work because it looks for exact matches and you can't match one word with two words. Um, so what we need to do is basically take them apart for a couple for a couple of purposes here just for removing the stop words. So again, we'll use the same stop word list. 
Um, but because again, you can see these are single words and we have bigrams, we need to separate the bigrams. So we're splitting them up and the command is called separate. So we want to separate the bigram column um, and we want to kind of split that up into two new columns um, and those should be called, we'll just call them word one and word two and we'll need those later anyway. So that's useful anyway. And then where do we split these up? And you can see that they have a space in between. So we're telling R, find the space and at the space, split these up into two columns. So that's why separator is a space here. So sep equals space. And then the last argument in separate is remove equals false. So usually when you separate, it deletes the original column, but we'd actually like to keep it. So that's why we're setting remove to false. So keep the bigram column. Okay, and then it looks like this. So you have um, down the, word one is down, word two is the, and so on. And now we can actually match up, match up um, these single words to our stop word um, data frame. Okay, so what we're doing here is we're using filter. So we're filtering for words that, or for bigrams where word one is not, that's what the exclamation mark is for, in um, the word column of stop words. And where word two is also not in the stop word list. So if either of those two words is in the stop word list, it gets removed or the entire row gets removed, the bigram gets, gets removed. Okay, so it can be either word one is here is the, um, that will get removed or if you had something like to the and the was the second word that would also get removed, right? So either of the two um, needs to be in the stop word list for it to be removed. Okay, so I'll run that. And you can see from this that we don't have these grammatical words like to and the and an and so on. So we can count that again. And you can see it looks quite different. So now we have mock turtle, march hare, white rabbit, poor Alice, and so on as the most frequent stop word, um, not stop words, <laughs> most frequent content words. And we can plot these um, like we did with the single word frequencies. So we're just counting up the bigrams like we've been doing. I've added in a filter. So anything that occurs um, more than four times should be kept. And then I'm again reordering the bigram by how frequent it is so that the most frequent ones will be shown first um, using GM call because we want a bar chart. And I'm flipping the coordinate system because that makes the text a bit easier to read or the n-grams a bit easier to read. Okay, so here we go. We have uh, mock turtle, march hare, white rabbit, and so on. Yeah, I'll pause here for questions. Okay. Okay, so maybe you're interested in specific words and you want to see in which uh, bigrams they appear in. So we could do this by using filter. So let's say we're looking for bigrams where one of the two words is Alice. We can do filter word one equals Alice or, so this is a logical or operator, word two is Alice. And then I'm just using distinct. So we don't, we only see the distinct bigrams. So the unique bigrams. And then we see Alice started, poor Alice, Alice ventured, and so on. Or we could also do count if you want to see how often they occur. So then you have the bigrams where one of the two words is Alice. So that's one option. Um, so filter does exact matching. So word one or word two needs to be exactly Alice. So that doesn't give you um, things like Alice's, so apostrophe S or something. 
So we can also alternatively use string detect again. So find in bigrams the string Alice, and because that does kind of partial matching, you also get this, for example, which you wouldn't get with the filter option because it looks to match Alice exactly. Okay. Again, pausing for questions. <laughs> All right. So um, we looked at kind of characteristic uh, words per book, per document with the TFIDF uh, function. And we can also do the same thing for bigrams or other n-grams. Um, and earlier we did that for the three different books. So characteristic words per book. And here we'll do it for each chapter. So we're looking for characteristic words for each of these chapters. And that's why we extracted that chapter information. Um, so here I'm using um, the data frame where the stop words have been removed. And then I'm counting, I'll just execute this part. I'm counting how often each biogram appears per chapter. So you can see chapter one, um, air, I'm, occurs just once. Um, cats eat uh, in chapter one, we find three times and so on. So that's what the bind tf idf function needs. So it needs to know um, where's the text? That's in the biogram column. Um, what's the grouping kind of? So we want to do this separately for each um, group. So we want to find the characteristic words per chapter. And then the count is in the N column. Okay, so just like before, we now have characteristic words per chapter instead of per book. And we can have a look at these. So looking at that, you can see, okay, something's happening in chapters nine and 10 with a mock turtle. Um, chapter seven is all about the March hare. <laughs> um, and there's beautiful soup being eaten in chapter 10. <laughs> so these are just the characteristic words for each chapter. And the interpretation is, is like we said before, if this is a high number, so a high TFIDF, it means that this biogram in that case is um, specific to the chapter and mostly occurs in this chapter and doesn't occur very much in the other in the other chapters. Okay, we can again plot that. So this is also very similar to how we did that before. Um, so we're just grouping by chapter and I'm usually I'm using a different um, command, but this does the same thing as top n. Not sure why I'm using a different command, but this is also the same as top n. So um, get the, here in this case, three bigrams with the highest T of IDF and then plotting it. And I'll just run it. Okay. And you can see some of these. So I said three and R didn't listen to me. And this is just because we ha again have ties. So this is a fairly small data source. It's just one book and not a very long book. So that's why some of these biograms get the same T of IDF value. And that's why it gives us more than three for some of the chapters. So the way we made that graph um, is really similar to before. So um, we are reordering the biograms by the T of IDF um, values. We're color coding by chapter. We're using GM call for a bar chart um, and then facet wrap. So we get one mini plot for each chapter. Okay. All right. Again, questions? Oh, just one comment about how cool our little graph was. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Well, if you like that one, you'll like what we'll do next. <laughs> um, because next we'll go into visualizing networks. Um, so this is a really nice, um, this was also kind of a new thing for me. I don't really do a lot of kind of network analysis. So there might be some people in the chat who are more um, familiar with this, but we would like to show all the, the bigrams or the words that occur together in bigrams in a network graph. Um, and we need two packages. We need iGraph and ggGraph. What we'll do first is again, a little bit of data wrangling. So we're again counting the bigrams, 
But instead of doing count by gram, we need to use this word one and word two, um, these word one and word two columns. Um, because the, for the graph later, we need these, this information separate. We need to know which one was the first word, which one was the second. Um, but it does the same thing. It essentially counts the bigrams. It just uses the two columns, but it again, just counts the bigrams. We're doing that for the entire book. And then we're using a filter. So this is just three. So anything that occurs more often than three times, because this is a small um, text. So this is a really small or low filter. And then we're piping into graph from data frame. And this will kind of um, wrangle the data in a way that the graph command needs to plot it. And we're calling that Alice graph. And this is from iGraph. And then we're using GGraph um, to actually plot that. Uh, and one thing we'll do before we plot that is we'll set a seed. Um, this is kind of optional. So this is just because some aspects of this, so the exact layout, um, yeah, are kind of random. We're just setting the seed so we all get the same looking graph or a similar looking graph. And also so that if you rerun the script in two months, that you also get the same graph again. So this is what set seed does. So every time you do something that has some kind of a random element to it, it's, it's a good idea to set a seed so the results are reproducible. Okay, and I'll just run it so, so you can actually see what it looks like because I think it was a bit abstract. Okay. So this is the first um, version of our graph and you can see the bigrams being plotted here. So you can see we have here, we have Cheshire Cat. We have a little bit of a um, yeah nice network for Alice. So Alice cried, Alice replied, poor Alice and so on. We have something going on with white, with the white rabbit, with a rabbit hole. And right? so you can, so this is just trying to plot the words or the bigrams. Yeah, the words that occur together in these bigrams. So let's take a closer look at um, the code. So this works kind of similar to ggplot in the sense that um, there are these layers that you add on. So the, the command is ggraph. So instead of ggplot, um, it's ggraph. Then the data that we're plotting is what we just made. So this Alice graph here, where we just counted the words, filtered them, and then piped into this command. Um, so this is a layout that works well for these biograms. Um, otherwise, if you choose different layouts, it's trying to connect all of them and that doesn't make sense because not all of them occur together. So um, this works well for, for biograms. And then you're adding um, this edge link and node point, these geomes. So the nodes are basically those, um, yeah, the dots. So the nodes would be word one and word two. And um, the links are the lines connecting word one and word two if they occur together in bigrams. Um, but then we also want to know we also want to know which words, otherwise that would be kind of boring to look at. So that's why we're using geom node text. And the aesthetics for that is just um, the name label equals name. So that's just the word. Um, and then these options are just to make sure that uh, the dots don't cover the text too much. So this is just kind of nudging the text upwards and sideways a little bit um, so you can read it a little bit better. Okay, so now we know which words occur together in, in bigrams, but we can make the graph a bit prettier. Um, and something we also don't know is which word comes first. So for example, here, is it tree rose or rose tree? Yeah, for some of them, you, I guess you can, you can guess, but it would be nicer if we knew which word was the first and which word was the second. Okay, so we'll do a couple of things here. Um, we would like to have arrows pointing from the first word to the second word. So we're creating a little, um, yeah, an arrow called A basically. So this is from the grid package. It says, okay, make an arrow, um, which should be closed and which should have a certain length. You can play around with the length a little bit. So this makes an, an arrow basically that will reuse. 
Okay, and then we'll make a few changes. Um, okay. So for the links, so these are the lines connecting the dots, so connecting the words. Um, we would like to make them more transparent um, if the bigram is not as frequent. So we're adding um, an aesthetic element here. We're saying edge alpha um, is N. So look at how often they occur and if they um, occur more often then make then color the, the link a little bit more. Um, then arrow is A. So A is just what we, what we just defined. We just made a little arrow. Um, and then this end cap, this just makes sure that the arrows don't touch the points too much so that they can stop right in front of them. You'll see, I'll just, I'll just run it so you can see what we're actually doing. Maybe that's a bit better. Okay. Yeah, so you see, we now have these arrows pointing. So we know it's March hair um, and trembling voice and so on and rose tree. Okay, uh, what else are we doing? So we're picking a color for the nodes. So for these dots, we want to color them differently. And this is just um, a hex code. So this is a way to get colors. I picked that because it's kind of similar to the Our Lady's purple, but you could also just type in something like red. And then you'd have red, red dots. Uh, and I'm also making them a bit larger. Uh, this is not changed. I'm adding theme void. So theme void gets rid of a lot of elements. So this here just gets rid of the, the background for us before we had this kind of gray beige-ish background. And here it's just completely gone. It's just white. And then I've added a title. Okay. Yeah, questions on that? Okay, so in that case, we have two exercises or two suggestions. You can pick one as well. Um, yeah, so you can basically pick a team. <laughs> do you like Taylor Swift better or do you like Beyonce better? Uh, so we're giving you data that was Tidy Tuesday data or like old Tidy Tuesday data. I'll just read in both so you can have a look. So these are song lyrics from Taylor Swift and from Beyonce. So I'm, I've just read those in and we can have a peek. So here for the Taylor Swift data, you have a column called lyrics where you have the lyrics for the entire um, song and you have the song title and also the album where it's from. And for Beyonce, you also have the lyrics, you have them line by line but that doesn't really matter. Everything, it works the same way, no matter if it's line by line or if it's, um, yeah, if it's one line per song. And you also have the song, uh, yeah, you have the song name and also which line it is, but you'll probably look at the song name. And what we suggested you could, you could do um, just to try out what we've been talking about is with the Taylor Swift lyrics, because we have album information, it would be, maybe interesting to look at the characteristic words for each album or the characteristic biograms for each album. So you could, with that, you could recreate that TF-IDF bar graph that we use or that we had with um, the book chapters of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. And you could redo that for the albums to see um, characteristic biograms per Taylor Swift album in her lyrics. And for the Beyonce data, what we thought would be nice is um, create this network graph that we just showed of biograms when they occur at least 15 times. So you can um, pick which one you prefer um, and work on start working on that. So these are completely separate. Um, and if you have time, you can then also move on to the other one. I've given you steps, kind of step-by-step -step tips that you can look at if you want to. You can also just try it all um, on your own if you prefer. <laughs>